So here's a little trivia for you. Do you know what Air Force, Akron, Alabama State, Albany, Elkhorn State, American, Appalachian State, Arkansas State, Arkansas, Pine Bluff, Belmont, Binghamton, Boise State, Boston University, Brown, Buffalo, Cal Poly, Cal State Bakersfield, Cal State Fullerton, Cal State Northridge, Campbell, Canisius, Central Connecticut, Charleston Southern, Coastal Carolina. Co you know what? I'm not going to read all these. But do you know what they have in common? All these schools have appeared in the NCAA tournament since it expanded to 64 teams in 1985, but none of them have won a single game in the field of 64. That's a staggering 41% of all teams to appear in this bewildering tournament. Now, a big reason for this is that a lot of these schools have only appeared in the tournament one or two times, but let's stack this up alongside other tournaments. There are, coincidentally, 122 teams in the big four pro sports. Only three are without a playoff win in this time span. Normal tournaments give almost all their teams at least one win over the course of a few decades, but not the NCAA tournament. Welcome to the Loser Machine. These days, the NCAA tournament is technically 68 teams, not 64. The tournament is kicked off by four play-in games. The winners of those are then seeded into the 64-team bracket. I'm going to disregard these games for a very important reason, which is that I don't care. These games are nothing but ploys to trick people into watching True TV. I searched for every time someone tweeted, what channel is True TV in 2017? Hey, there's the play-in games. Hey, there's, uh, cops. Anyway, on its face, the actual tournament plays out about how you think it would. The one seed wins most often, the second seed wins second most often, third seed wins third most often, it pretty much goes in order just like that. But within the large, normal looking pattern, a lot of little weird patterns are hiding. So look, here's the winning percentage of every seed in the first round and the second round. It's natural for these teams to dip and win a little less in the second round because your opponent is probably going to be more difficult. But look at seeds 10, 11, and 12. With a pretty decent sample size, they do better. Why? I don't know. There's no exploit in the bracket that's obvious to me. These teams are almost always going to run into a 2, 3, or 4 seed. Maybe they're just emboldened by their first round upset, or maybe their opponent underestimates them. I can't really say. The structure of this bracket looks about as balanced as it could be to the naked eye. The 1 seed has the easiest road, and the 16 seed has the toughest road, but in a sense, that's not actually true. So here's what I did. I scored every seed's road to the championship by difficulty. They're given difficulty points in the inverse of the seed they face. So just to take the uh, 9 seed as an example, they play an 8 seed in the first round, so that's 9 difficulty points. Then assuming they face their most probable opponent, the 1 seed, that's 16 points. Then 4, that's 13 points. Then a 2 seed, that's 15 points. And then 16 points from there on out to end up with 85 difficulty points, right? I'll admit that I'm really oversimplifying here. The difference between a 1 and a 2 is a lot different between, say, a 15 and a 16. But this is the logic that governs the tournament. So here is the difficulty score of every seed. This is looking like it should. The 1 seed has the easiest road, then it gets a little tougher for every seed after that. Then it, um, flatlines for a second. Then it goes back up, only to stall again. And then once it gets to the 15th and 16th seeds, it goes down. It gets easier. This chart changes directions four times. How does a system so seemingly regimented like this make that? Math is weird. But in the end, this is really little more than a mathematical curiosity. What really throws this tournament into chaos is its lack of reseeding. The architects of this tournament had a choice. They could choose between order and disorder. They chose disorder. If they had chosen order, they would have reseeded the teams at some point. That's what they do in the WNBA, for example. After the second round of the WNBA playoffs, they reassign the weakest seed to play the strongest seed, which makes sense. But that's just an eight-team tournament. This would make far, far more sense with a 64-team tournament, in which there are enormous gaps in talent between the strongest and weakest seeds. What we've got here is disorder. It happens all the time. And listen, I'm not complaining. I, I love disorder. I think it's great. I'm just saying that it inevitably leads a few teams to leave the tournament before they quote unquote should. This over here is the winning percentage of every seed in the Sweet 16 round of the tournament. Looks a little weird, right? Why does an 8 seed have triple the winning percentage of a 5 seed? How come an 11 seed has almost double the winning percentage of a 5 seed? Well, this is the round in which the 5, like the 4, almost always runs into the 1. So the problem with using this data is that the sample for each individual seed is a little limited, so let's do this. Let's group them together. Naturally, seeds 1 and 2 do very well in the Sweet 16. 
Teams with seeds 6 through 11 have made the Sweet 16 128 times. They've won 49 of those games. Good for a winning percentage of 382. And now teams with seeds 3 through 5. Ready for this? 174 total Sweet 16 appearances. 61 total Sweet 16 wins. Winning percentage? 350. It's all about staying as far away from the 1 and the 2 seeds as you can. And that's the sneaky thing about this tournament. It's silently, without anyone noticing, gives the supposed Cinderella's a slightly easier road from the Sweet 16 to the Elite 8. The 4 and 5 seeds have it so rough in this round. In the Sweet 16, the 4 seeds opponent's average seed is 2.25, and the 5 seed on average goes up against a 1.7 seed. Meanwhile, much weaker seeds face other much weaker seeds. The 9, for example, faces an average of a 6.2 seed. But that's what this tournament does. That's what it does at this point to some of its weaker teams. By not reseeding after each round, it gives them an invisible little nudge toward whichever superlative they earn before being sent home. Sweet 16, Elite 8, Final 4. These rounds are named like credit cards for good reason. Well, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Valparaiso, you don't qualify for the Final 4 and you never will, but we at the NCAA are proud to offer you the Sweet 16 tier. Well over half of all schools to send a team to the field of 64 have failed to escape the Sweet 16. And for most schools, reaching the Final Four is virtually impossible. In fact, just 12 schools, the top 4%, account for the majority of all Final Four appearances. By virtue of its unnecessarily colossal size, the NCAA tournament produces far more losers than any other sports tournament. Building one winner comes at the cost of 63 losers. There is some madness in March Madness, but in large part that chaos is both manufactured and contained by the system, and serves only to cast the illusion of hope. In theory, everyone gets a shot at the title. Everyone gets to play. Everyone gets to dream. In practice, victory is hoarded by a predestined few. But the rest are still permitted to hope, because hope costs nothing. Does this remind you of anything? If it does, sound off in the comments.